Praise the Lord, everyone. I'm going to read a short passage from Psalm 91, and we'll take it from there. Psalm 91, He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress. My God, in Him will I trust. Surely He shall deliver thee from the snare of the fowler and of the noisome pestilence. He shall cover thee with his feathers, and under his wings shall thou trust. His truth shall be thy shield and buckler. Thou shalt not be afraid for the terror by night, nor for the arrow that flieth by day, nor for the pestilence that walketh in darkness, nor for the destruction that wasteth at noonday. A thousand shall fall at thy side, and 10,000 shall fall at thy right hand, but it shall not come nigh thee. Only with thine eye shall thou behold and see the reward of the wicked, because thou hast made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the Most High, thy habitation. If we could all stand at this time, we had begun a thing around here, I'll call it a thing, where at the beginning of service, we all came down to the front and we would spend a a few minutes in prayer and that. But we got away from that because of the obvious situations that have been all around us this year in 2020. So what we're going to do is we're going to start off the service in prayer, but instead of everybody coming down here, stay where you're at and pray like you would have come down. Seek the Lord. Obviously. I mean, you have to have been living in a cave somewhere not to realize the hour that we're living in and the things that are going on and that they are most likely going to get more challenging in the months to come. So we're going to sit and we're going to pray and we're going to get a hold of God and we are going to believe that God is going to move today. So let's pray and then you guys pray where you're at. Father, in Jesus' name, we come before you today. We believe in you, Lord, mighty God. Your word is true. You're faithful to your people. Mighty Lord God, as we stand in the situations that we're in down here on this earth, Lord, we're lifting up our voices. We know that you hear us. You're all around us in Jesus' name. You're in us by way of your Holy Spirit in Jesus' name. We are believing, mighty God, hallelujah, that you are going to speak to your people this day, that you are going to give instruction to your people this day. We thank you and we praise you, mighty God. We are believing, Lord, hallelujah, in Jesus' name, that you are going to move amidst your people today. In Jesus' name, mighty Lord, we are going to see, hallelujah, the manifestation of your Holy Spirit in our lives. In Jesus' name, we are going to feel the touch of your presence among us today. In Jesus' name, we thank you and we praise you, mighty God. We call it done by faith in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. Saints, continue to pray for a few more minutes. Get a hold of God for yourself, whatever your needs are. Hallelujah. Whatever you have need of. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Get to have a relationship with your God. Hallelujah. We thank you and we praise you, Jesus. Glory.
right now. Hallelujah, Jesus. We thank you, Lord, for everything that you do for us, God. We praise your name in this place. We lift you up in this place today, God. Hallelujah, Jesus. We give you all thanks and glory, God. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Lord Jesus. Praise your name. I'm going to do this a little different than I told you I was going to do it, Sister Tammy. I just feel right now I'm up here to pray for any needs that we have. We have physical needs in this place. We have financial needs in this place. We have emotional needs in this place and in this world. So why don't we just go back into the bridge and say, Jesus, and if you have a need or you know someone that has a need, why don't we just lift him up in this presence right now and believe that God can make a way? Because I don't know about you, but I know that our God is what this world needs. It's everything that we need in this place. So why don't we just lift him up and just call simply on his name and let's just let his miracles happen in this place today. Hallelujah. Just take a moment right now and worship him in this place. Any needs that we have right now, just lift them up to the Lord right now. Lord Jesus, we thank you, God, for being in this place, Lord. We know that there are needs in this place, needs in our congregation and needs in our family that need to be met, Lord God. And we just simply call on your name today, Jesus. We reach out to you in this place, Lord God, in your presence, Lord God, and bring our needs to you in faith, believing, God, that you can make a way. Hallelujah, Lord Jesus, we lift you up in this place. We thank you, Lord God. We call on your name today, Jesus. Hallelujah, Lord. Oh, Jesus, we love you, Lord. Hallelujah. Oh, Jesus. Jesus. around me you are the hope to the hopeless the broken you are the only truth and the way truth and the way truth and the way why don't we just one more time just lift him up for another moment god we thank you jesus for being in this place Lord, we lift you up today, God. We thank you, God. Hallelujah, Lord. Jesus, hallelujah, Lord God. We give you all praise and honor in this place today, Jesus. Hallelujah, Lord. You all may be seated. As we transition right now, I would like to show a video on the screen.
We're a little late with this announcement as the deadline for She's for Christ is actually today. Um, But uh, I talked to Pastor this week, and uh, we have a few weeks to get our offering in. Um, And for those of you that don't really know what She's for Christ is, it's a offering that uh, the UPC has every year, and it goes to different things like glo- for global missionaries so that they can have vehicles and uh, different uh, types of needs that they have there. It goes to our North American missions who are here starting churches. It goes towards uh, the children's Tupelo mansions and the New Beginnings Orphanage home. It also goes for Illinois here when it comes to our camps, our conventions, and everything we do there. And I was looking at the list of all the different things that they give to, and there's they either go towards starting a church or reaching out through the gospel, or it is for our youth and teaching them uh, you know, how to go out and how to impact their world. And as I was thinking about that, we were singing that song today, and we were talking about how Jesus, he's the truth and the way, he's the light. This offering does so much for us and for our church. It goes to the, uh, the, the missionaries and everything like that, and it helps us just reach our world. And I can't think of a better way to spend money right now than to have our gospel spread throughout this world because we see throughout the news, we see everywhere that there's just chaos and destruction everywhere. And that's what you know people have to see on a daily basis. But if we can have young people and we can have missionaries that are equipped to go out and preach his word, you know, we can be that light that this world needs in all this chaos and darkness. So just keep that in mind uh, these next couple weeks. And if you're going to give the offerings due in the next few weeks. But yeah, She's for Christ uh, is coming up here soon. I'm going to see a victory. I'm going to see a victory.
want to see my victory for this battle belongs to you Lord I'm gonna see my victory I'm gonna see my victory for this battle belongs to you Lord and I'm gonna see my victory I'm gonna see today, God. In the name of Jesus. My Jesus, my Jesus. Hallelujah. Glory, 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 glory. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. The truth of the matter is, if we would capture the essence of that song today, how different our lives would be. That first part of that song says about prevailing, that first verse. What that simply says is no matter what you're facing, you are not going to be destroyed. No matter what you've been going through, you will come out prevailing. You are going to be victorious. Why is that? Because the battle's not yours. Because what you're facing, it might seem evil against you. But when God gets involved, He takes what seems to be for your destruction and turns around for your benefit today. Hallelujah. Amen. I believe God's going to do a work today. Would you just lift your hands in this house today and just ask God to help you today. God, help us today in this house, God. God, let us give God grasp, God, of what we just sung today, God. God, there's victory in the house today, God, for someone. God, there's been some dark times, God, but today, God, victory is here for them today. God, we receive your word today in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. God bless you. You may be seated. Thank you, Lord. I find that there's a lot of opinions running rampant and thoughts on what to do 
how to do it, what not to do, how not to do it. Truthfully, as I begin to say that, you, 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 your thoughts already went to something that you agree with or something that you disagree with. If we survey this room today, and we pick out any subject you want. Some of you will be in agreement. Some of you will be in disagreement. Because we see things through our own eyes. We process circumstances through our own thoughts. However, I'm safe to say there are some things that we agree on. That universally, those in this room today and those watching online today agree upon. There is an undeniable truth that there is one God who sits on the throne, who rules and reigns, who has the battle in his hand, who is in control, who knows how to bring us from where we're at today to a victorious place. That one God sees all and understands all and is in control of all today. He's not surprised about where our world is today. He's not surprised by the environment that you're in today. He's not surprised by the opinions of your thoughts and your opinions. He's not surprised by the way that you come up with a solution to the problem today. You're not catching him off guard today because he alone is all-knowing and he's all-powerful. And everything that happens to you and I happens by divine purpose and by divine uh, uh revelation and intervention and by his will today so the fight that you're on in the end right now may be a shock to you but it's not shocking God the giant that's screaming at you in your face you may feel like I don't know how to deal with this I don't know how to help I feel so insignificant and helpless but I want you to know that God's still able today. The messy life that you're in and you look around and you say, I just don't get it. I don't understand. I can't, I can't understand the circumstance. I want you to know that God sees you all the way through the circumstance. And though your natural eyes may find that it's overwhelming and may find that you feel like it's just bigger than you are and you can't help to go any further, and you don't know how tomorrow's going to hold out, I want you to know today that the mighty God knows exactly where you're at, knows exactly the road you're on today. Whatever you're going through today, He's already destined you to be victorious today. Come on, you got to understand this principle right now. You might be clawing your way every day just trying to gain a little ground. And you might be saying, I'm digging and I'm scratching and I'm fighting for just a little bit. But God wants to remind you from the outset, He doesn't see you today. He sees you tomorrow. He sees you victorious. He sees you elevated today. What you're facing It's not by chance. It's not by accident. It's not by some circumstance out of your control and you're saying, I didn't have nothing to do with it. Can I just tell you today, where you're at is by divine intervention. It's by purpose today. Even though we don't feel like it. And even though we don't enjoy it. And nobody likes to be in the battle. It's necessary You know, we've used this word often in these last six months, the word essential. We've heard that word about 55,000 times. You never knew how essential you were. Better than that, you never knew how essential toilet paper was until it was obsolete, right? You couldn't get it. It was pretty essential. Now, can I get a witness on that one? (laughs) But it's necessary, and it's essential for your good. Because he's allowing you to come to this situation and this place. The one that brought you into this is the same one that's going to be with you through it. And more importantly, is the one that's going to bring you out of it. He's not letting you alone today. You have your Bibles. You can turn with me to Genesis chapter 32. 
I want to speak along this subject today. We're going to read it in Scripture, but it's very simple. He prevailed. Genesis 32 and 24, they're going to throw it up on the screen. And the Scripture says, And Jacob was left alone. And there he wrestled with a man, with him until the breaking of day. And when he saw that he prevailed not against him, he touched the hollow of his thigh, and the hollow of Jacob's thigh was out of joint. As he wrestled with him, and he said, Let me go, for the day breaketh. He said, I will not let thee go, except thou bless me. And he said unto him, What is thy name? And he said, Jacob. He said, Thy name shall be called no more Jacob, but Israel. For as a prince, thou hast power with God and with men, and hast prevailed. I want you to know something. You have a prevailing spirit in you today. You have something in the inside of you that when it looks like you can't make it today, looks like you don't have any more strength today, there's something on the inside of you that's going to prevail in the circumstance that you're in. Let me give a little background of where the story is at. Most of you have heard it once or twice in your life. But we find that Jacob was in a place that many people are. He was running. He was running from a lot of things, a lot of thoughts. The Bible says early in the story that he tricked his brother into giving him his birthright. And why is this so significant today? Without spending a lot of time on it, it's very simple. I'm going to break it down as simply as I can because that's how I understand it. God made a covenant with Abraham. This covenant said, Abraham, if you'll follow me, I will bless you and I will multiply your seed and I will be an abundant God to you. But all you have to do is just follow me. That same promise was transferred in the birthright from Abraham to Isaac. And Abraham's spiritual leadership led his son Isaac to receive that same covenant promise from God. And it would continue to descend it, to descend it, to descend it. So this birthright that we're talking about today wasn't something to take lightly. But it was a covenant promise between God and man. One that in exchange for obedience brought back an extreme abundance of blessing, provision, wisdom. Think about it. Think about this for a moment. As a covenant relationship that you would be able to enter into God, with God, you would have the understanding spiritually how to lead your family in the right way that they should go. Not only to have the spiritual understanding, but to have the, um, shall we say, respect for the rest of your family, to follow what you're uh, leading and how you're guiding. Extremely valuable. It wasn't just about physical blessings and about being rich and having money. It was about favor. It was favor among those around you, other nations. That when you walked into their environment, their environment was blessed. Can I say it that way? It was something bigger than just a birthright, as we would think. Just passing down something to someone else. But this meant that you was entering a relationship with the Almighty God. And that relationship not only gave you the wisdom and direction, but it transcended beyond the current family you lived in to your descendants and to their descendants. And even though Jacob's older brother, Esau, rightfully should have owned and possessed the birthright because he was a firstborn, Esau despised his birthright. And in the right moment, Jacob tricked his brother into giving him this most prized possession, this birthright. And from that moment on, from that moment on, We find him running, running for his life, running from his thoughts, running from his rightful position, running from his calling. He's running. So we get to Genesis 32. And we find that for years, Jacob has been running from his past. He's known as this thief and as this deceiver and as this man of cunning ways. His thought process was simply this. They're out to get me. So I've got to be one step ahead of them. 
And the moment that I can't be one step ahead of them and figure it out, I've got to run. I've got to go somewhere else. I've got to get out of their presence. And for years, Jacob survived on this mentality of his own abilities and his own actions. And he trusted in his own ways. And though the Bible doesn't say this, I just wonder when I read this story, I just wonder, could it be that Jacob figured by his own actions, by his own ways, that this birthright, this spiritual blessing, the one that every son desires is long gone. Could it be that when he comes to this place that we find in Scripture, that Jacob says, I just don't know if I can, I just can't live up to it anymore. I've been running so long, I don't even know if that birthright thing is even real anymore. I don't even know if it's something that I can obtain. I don't even know if I can hold on to it anymore. Just because you've been running and just because you've been struggling with something in your past doesn't mean that God has forsaken you. And just because you feel like you have no hope of fulfilling what God has called you to do and no hope of entering into this covenant promise from what was promised many years ago, just because you feel that way doesn't mean God has forgotten where you're at and what he has promised to you. You see, God never changes his promises. He never turns back on them. So God's not surprised of where you've been. And God's not surprised about your past. In fact, he knows it better than anybody. But you know what also God knows that you don't? He knows your future today. He knows right where you're going today. He knows exactly where he sees you at, even though you can't see yourself there and you can't see yourself holding and possessing the promise that God has. God sees you in that state. God sees you as a victorious one. God sees you as the overcomer. And right in the middle of that, God does this unthinkable thing. You know how like God works sometimes? Unthinkable. We can't even understand it. Genesis 31 says, Jacob was running. While he was running, running, still doing it, running, God sends Jacob to what seems to be his end fate. Scripture says this, And the Lord said unto Jacob, Return unto the land of thy fathers, to thy kindred, and I will be with thee. You know, sometimes we read Scripture and we just read it and read on through it. I had to pause there for a moment in my studies. I said, now wait a minute, God. (laughs) Time out. This does not make sense to me. You're asking Jacob to return to a place where a people hate him and want to kill him. This has got to be his end. There can't be a future in this. God always knows what he's doing, even when it seems to be unthinkable and unobtainable and unfathomable to us. Even when our faith can't see it and can't explain it and can't focus on it and we don't see how it's going to come out, God does. God's not calling Jacob to understand. He doesn't call us to understand or figure out where we're at and where we're in. He doesn't call us to be able to explain the situation or be able to survive on our own abilities. God calls us simply to take a step of faith and obedience. The Bible says he loaded up his wives and his sons and his belongings and everything he had on camels and away he went. The act of simple obedience, even when Jacob didn't understand. In fact, can I just say it this way? Like every good wife, his wife said, what are you doing? (laughs) Read in scripture. She challenged him, and rightfully so, because she understood what that meant. There's no doubt in the tents, she's heard some stories, and she's heard how Bad it was. How much his brother hates him and how much he's going to kill him. And the last thing his brother said to him and on and on and on and on. And rightfully so, the questions came. 
and, and, and the tax came and the challenges came. And yet we find Jacob simply obeying the word of the Lord. Sometimes God takes us back to places that we don't want to go to. And he does that to remind us of the promise he made at that moment. Those promises that tells you what he is going to do in you and through you. And yet we're so far away. And yet we can't even understand it. And we look and we say, God, this, this whole thing doesn't make sense. And you have people saying, this ain't right. Are you sure you heard from God? You're going to go to a place and you purposely are entering into a place where it's not going to be for your good. Many times that journey back takes us to a place where we don't understand. We can't comprehend. But can I just tell you today, it's the exact place that God wants you to be. You see, it's a place where you can't depend on your own abilities anymore. And you can't connive your way and you can't uh, talk your way out of it and you can't explain it and you can't figure it out. It's a place where you have to be totally dependent on walking in obedience with God. So now we get to our scripture text today. And I believe that these few scriptures that we read has great revelation for someone today. Genesis thirty-two twenty-four 24 says, And Jacob was alone, a place where no one else was around. What I didn't tell you the rest of the story was he got all the way to the place where he needed to meet Esau. He sends everybody away, and that night he spends the night alone. He's alone with God. All distractions removed. The busyness of life. No Facebook feed. No Instagram feed. No text messages blowing up. Uh, He got disconnected from society. Disconnected from the voices in his ear. Disconnected from what he's been running from. And there he finds himself removed from all distractions. What I find is before God ever accomplishes his will in one's life, he brings us to a place of solitude. You can look scripturally time and time again. David faced a giant. Job finds himself alone with God. Peter finds himself in his face planted because of the denial that he did before the Lord. And I could go on and on and on. They bring them, God brings them to a place of solitude so all distractions are removed. Distractions can be words. Distractions can be thoughts. It can be one's past. It can be one's present. It can be situations that one's in. And it can be mistakes that one has made. But to truly have an encounter with the Almighty God, it means that one must get personal and private with Him. Let's look at it this way. Even though we're in a public setting and even though we all came to church and we worship together, God is interacting privately with you and I. Yeah, you felt corporate worship, but what you really felt was the presence of God touching your life. Sure, our outward expressions, they represent what's being done internally, but it's that internal spirit that's moving inside of us. You see, the purpose that we're together is not for public demonstration, but for private development. The reason you come to church, yes, is to see one another. It's to see your smiling faces. It's to catch up, see how you're doing, right? Yes, it's because the Bible says, forsake not the assemblies of one another. But what you're really here for, if we really get down to the nuts and bolts of it is, you're here to have an encounter with God, a private encounter with God. Every service, and I can't think of one yet, that we don't gather for pre-service prayer among our team, and we say, Lord, we, and this is what we pray, that our hearts and our minds and our spirits would be open and ready to receive the Word of God. Why do we say it that way? Because that prayer says, 
We're praying that your feelings and your emotions would feel the presence of God internally. That your thoughts would process this word that's spoken and this word that illuminates and it would internalize inside of you and that your spirit would take that word and it would plant it deep down inside because when you plant the word of God inside of you, internally it produces roots and it takes hold and it comes out and it brings something forth that wasn't in you before. Every service we pray that. Does God speak collectively? Yes, he does. Absolutely. But what I find in scripture is God's plan and God's purpose is always individually. When he wants to bring his will to this world, it happens through individuals. You see, God's plan for your life and God's purpose for your life isn't being developed in the moment. It's not happening because... You got to this situation and God said, okay, now what do we do? But God has already determined a path and a will for you today. He already knows what your tomorrow is. You see, while Jacob was in the womb, his mama was spoken to by God Almighty. And she said, inside of you, you have twins. And in those two twins, there are two nations battling inside of you. And I want you to know, Rebecca, that the younger is going to rule over the older. Before Jacob was born, he was already destined to fulfill God's promise. And yet he finds himself alone with God at the end of his road where there's no hope and there's no tomorrow. You see, when the prophetic is spoken in your life, the process by which you go, you must prevail. And when you prevail, it brings you to the place of promise. What I'm trying to say is when God's spoken something to you and you find yourself in a God-designed place where you're saying, I don't understand this. Just get ready. Just prevail a little bit because he's taking you to the place of promise. He's taking you to the place where he sees you. Verse 25. And when he saw that he prevailed not against him, he touched the hollow of his side, and the hollow of Jacob's thigh was out of joint, and he wrestled with him. The scripture says simply this. Jacob was broken by God. He allowed God to break him. He allowed God to affect him. He allowed God to change him, to alter him. Jacob had to come to a place where he was wrestling uh, with what he knew he was supposed to do, but what he is today. Jacob was wrestling with the thought of, I know I I should obtain the birthright. I know I should take hold of it. But look where I'm at today. I'm not ready for that. I'm not able to do that. Look who I am. Look what I'm running from. And Jacob knew what his tomorrow faced. In his eyes, he was at the end of it all. Running, running, running. He was going to meet his brother, the one that hated him, the one that desired to kill him. Jacob's hopes and his dreams and his chances of ever being what God called him to be was being crushed by every minute of every moment of that night. Jacob's future was over. Jacob's hope was over. And the only thing that Jacob had left, he couldn't rely on his family. He couldn't rely on his wives. He couldn't rely on the blessings of God. Everything was away from him. The only thing that he could do is he could wrestle and hold on to the last hope that he had. You see, Psalms 34 says this. The Lord is near the brokenhearted and saves those that are crushed in spirit. Could it be that the word of the Lord's coming to you today in the midst of where you're at and you're feeling alone, but God is very near to you. You might feel that you're overwhelmed. You might feel that it's all over today. You might say, I'm at the end of the rope and I'm holding on to the last thread that I could possibly hold on to and my spirit's crushed, God, and I don't know, God, how this is going to turn out and I can't tell you tomorrow, God, but the very presence of God is with you today. He heals the broken hearted. He binds up their wounds today. And something transpires 
from verse 25 to verse 26 in the life of Jacob. Something just transformed. I can't understand it and I can't explain it, but something wells up within him. He gets some resolve inside of him and he says, uh, the, the, the man says, let me go. But Jacob said, I will not let you go. I'm not going to let go. I'm not going to let loose. I have to hold on. All right, let me break this down to something really practical. This is how I see things. We've talked about this, right? Thursday night, I see things very practical. How many of you are, are, are a parent, grandparent, uncle, aunt, sibling? Did we get everybody? So I don't know how it happened in your household, but I would come home from work. My kids were this high, right? At some point, Zach and Joe about got the same height. And what would happen, not every day, but what would happen is they would come, and I'd pat little Zach on the head, little Jillian on the head, and I'm more interested in talking to their mother than I am talking to them. I want to see how her day's going. I want to see what happened, Right? Talking adult talk. She's probably been tired of talking to the kids at their level, and she's ready for an adult conversation too. And I, I sit there, and I said, okay. I'd start walking their way, and all of a sudden, one would latch onto my leg. You ever had that happen? And they sit on your foot. And so now you're doing this. But it wasn't enough that one got on your foot. The other one got on your foot. And you would do this. And then you thought it was humorous. So what did you do? You purposely knocked into the chair. And you did, the, and you drug them, right? All the way across the car. We're going to try to burn, put a burn on them, right? I said, I, 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 I'm going to make you let go. And so you just keep going. And you hit them together, whatever it takes. And what does every kid do? And you see it in their little face. They grit their teeth. And they hold on for dear life. And they're not going to let go. I don't care what you do. I don't care how much you want to, you know, try to deter them. And what you do to them, they are not letting go. Why? Because they are starving for your attention. Is it a game? It might be to you. Is it to them? Absolutely not. From the outward, we might say, yes, it's a game. But when we talk about the intellect of a child, they are starving for their daddy's attention. And they're going to hold on to daddy's leg until daddy gets down on the floor and daddy plays with me and daddy gives me some attention and daddy gives me some affection and daddy gives me some affirmation. What I'm trying to tell you today is you are that same child today. Why don't you just get a hold of what God's doing and get a hold of him and say, daddy, I need your attention. I need your affection, daddy. I need I need your affirmation, Daddy. Right where I'm at, Daddy. I'm not going to let you go until you bless me. You hadn't got this yet. Let me help you with revelation of Scripture. Now, this is Rodney Kidder deep theology right here. I mean, I had to dig deep with this one. You know, sometimes you read the Word of God and you got to read between the lines. I'm not adding to. I'm not taking. I'm just reading the story. The Bible says this. For the day breaketh. That means that the daytime was coming. And the angel or the man or God, however you want to look at it, couldn't be caught in the daytime. Here's the revelation. The darkest hour, and everybody knows this, is always right before the break of dawn. The times where it seems like there is no hope, and I mean it's dark, and you can't see your hand in front of your face, and it's dark. It's right before the daytime. It's right before that sun crests the, the, the horizon and starts to come up. It's right before that moment where you're thinking, is it ever going to be sunlight? Am I ever going to make it? Hear me now. You might be in the darkest hour that you've ever faced. You might not even understand why you're facing it. But I've come to tell somebody today, hold on, hold on. Hold on. Come on, resolve in yourself. Hold on. 
I want you to say, I'm getting something on the inside of me. Something's transpiring right now in the spirit. Something's coming to you right now. And you're saying, I'm getting some resolution inside of me. I'm going to hold on. And I'm not leaving this place until I receive what God has for me. I'm not leaving this place, God, until you bless me. I'm not leaving this place, God, until you transform me. I cannot go on tomorrow, God, like I am today. I've got to see the miraculous. I've got to experience, God, what you have for me. The prophetic's already been spoken. You've just got to prevail. Think about it for a moment. Who has more power? I want you to think about this. Me or little Zach on my leg? I'm going to tell you I could just do a football punt and he would go flying off. I'm the adult here. I'm the bigger one. Could it be today? Could it be today that you're in this place? And could it be today that you're in an environment that God is allowing you to hold on? Where he has the ability to say, I could disengage you. I don't have to let you wrestle with me. I don't have to let you get a hold of me. You don't have the power to hold me down. But you know who I am? I'm God Almighty. With my spoken word, I could change this world upside down. But yet God allows us to engage him. And God allows us to wrestle with him. And God allows us to go through this process by which it takes every ounce of strength and then some to hold on. Jacob was no match for that angel today, that day. And yet he held on with all his might. Listen, your strength versus his strength is no match. You can't compare it. You can't have power over him. The battle that you're in right now, it might be stronger than you. But all I'm telling you to do is just obey and hold on. Just get some resolve in you to hold on. Because it's a test of the endurance of your will. It's a test to see, do you really want it? Do you really want God's blessing? Despite where you're at today, do you really want it? James says this. I kind of put it in my own words because I think it makes sense to me. You can look it up, James 1, 12. Blessed is a man who holds on under trial. For when he has withstood the test, he will receive the promise which God has already spoken in his life. Here's the awesome thing. So we find Jacob alone. We find Jacob being altered. We find Jacob holding on. And now we find Jacob having to face himself in the mirror. Verse 27, and I'm closing. The Bible says that the man said unto him, What is thy name? And Jacob was faced for the first time, face to face who he was. From the moment that he ran away from his his land of his father, and he ran away from the birthright, he ran away from the promises that God's called him to, and he ran and he ran and he ran. From that moment on, he had to turn around. And in that moment, he had to face who he was. He had to be honest with God. He had to stop pretending in order to let God work in his life. You know, God never works in a life with one that puts walls up. God's not going to beat down your walls. He's not going to kick your walls in to force you to let him work in in your life. He's not going to do that. And you might have walls in your life, and they're not physical. Matter of fact, nobody sees them. Can I just say that? Nobody knows them. But most definitely, they're internal walls. You see, we've built up these walls in our minds, in our hearts, about what we think we are, not what God thinks we are. we built up these walls in our minds, not about, about what others say we are, and not what God says we are. But at some point... In this private encounter with God, at the end of his rope, Jacob got transparent with God. You see, you got to be transparent if you want to be transformed. It doesn't happen any other way. You can't fool God. 
You can't say, God, well, let me pull one over on you. You've got to be open with God. What is your name? And he answered, my name is Jacob. You mean the deceiver? You mean the cunning one? You mean the trickster? You mean the guy that just talks his way out of every situation? You mean the guy that just runs when the heat gets too hot? That guy? Yeah, yeah, God. That's me. You mean the one that ran away from the promise? You mean the one that's still running? Yeah, God. Me. Here I am. You mean the one that's about to give up, Jacob? You mean the one that you don't know if you're going to make it till daybreak? Yeah, God, that's me. And if I die holding on to you, I'm going to die right here. But there's something inside of me. I'm going to be transformed in this moment. I'm, I'm going to be different, God. I'm not going to leave this place, God, until something happens. So, God, you're going to kill me right here where I'm at. Are you going to transform me? Because, God, I'm being transparent before you today. And the Bible says, the angel said, Thy name shall no more be called Jacob, but Israel. For as a prince, thou hast power with God. And look at the transformation. And with men. And the Bible says, and Jacob prevailed. He prevailed. God transformed him. He changed his identity. The process of prevailing brings you to a place of power. It's not your own power, but it's the power that's given to you by the new identity that God gives you. You're not who you think you are. You're not who others say you are, but you're who God thinks you are. He sees you as how he wants you. He says who you are because that's how he wants you to be. Your name has been changed. Your purpose has been defined. Your path is already set to the promise because you're transformed. God's given you the power because you prevailed. You prevailed. Jacob, you prevailed. I love one translation. It said this, you prevailed. I took that kind of personal. I said, God, I've walked through a lot of things. And I've been through some dark times, God. And I, when I didn't know what else to do, God, I just held on, God, to what I knew to do, God. I found myself in the midnight hour crying and pouring myself out, God. I found myself, God, weeping before you. And all I knew to do is just hold on, God. Because I needed a blessing. And I needed a touch, God. You see, what I've been coming to tell you these last 40 minutes is you have the power and the ability inside you to prevail. You have the ability and the power to overcome. You will endure today. You just got to hold on. You may not see the traits inside of you, but there's an almighty God that sees those traits inside of you. He sees how He created you. He sees the private place you're in. He sees the test. He sees the wrestling match. And He sees you prevailing as one that has power with God in man. Won't you stand with me? Let me give you something that you can take home today. Let me give you something as a God's getting ready to speak and he's getting ready to move. I feel, I really feel like somebody today, this is your day of victory. I really feel like the day is breaking and it's at that transitional moment. It's you're at a pivotal place right now. You're at a place where you said, I don't know. I don't know if I can make it one more minute in this dark hour. And God's just giving you an opportunity, a place and a time for you to hold on. The daytime's coming. And what we find is when daybreak came, when the day find the sun finally come up, and Jacob, no doubt exhausted, no doubt mentally drained, no doubt feeling like he has no strength left inside of him. He he can I say he wakes up, he comes to himself, he looks around, and what does he find? The deceiver's gone. The drifter's gone. The trickster's gone. The only thing that he finds left is Israel. What he sees himself as. 
one that has power with God. If I was to summarize this whole lesson in a few short words, it's simply this. God commanded, God challenged, God changed, and God called. God commanded Jacob to return to his homeland. God challenged Jacob's submission in the night. God changed Jacob's identity and future. And God called Jacob by a new name, Israel. God commanded Jacob to do the unthinkable. God challenged Jacob to do the untainable. God changed Jacob from the unacceptable. And God called Jacob from the unfavorable. What am I telling you today? It's simply this. You may think what you're facing is unthinkable. And you might think that the the thing that you're facing tomorrow is unattainable. And you might think, I am in an unfavorable situation. And I don't know why I'm here. But God has brought you to this place. He's brought you to this moment in this period in time so you can see his miraculous. God gave Jacob the power to prevail. It wasn't his own ability. He just had the resolve and the resolute and the ability to say, I'm going to hold on until you bless me. Why don't you bow your heads right now? In the name of Jesus. God, someone here today, someone, God, watching right now is facing some dark times. God, they don't know how they're going to make it tomorrow. And I feel the weight, God, of the hour on them. God, you know all month long I've been speaking to our men on Tuesday nights about this. You know, God, you've been stirring this in my spirit for six weeks plus. And I don't know who it's for today, God, but you've come with a word from the Lord today to speak to us. Somebody needs to lift their hands right now and receive what God's doing. Come on, don't wait for me. You need to reach God right where you're at today. Don't wait for me to wrap this thing up. This is the daybreak for you. This is the moment in time where you got to get a hold of something. You can't walk out of this place like you came in. You can't make it out of this place tomorrow like you came in today. You know the place you're in. You know the struggles you've faced. You know the thoughts that's been pounding your head every moment and the negativity. And you're saying, God, I can't make it one more day. I need a blessing, God. I need a transformation, God, in this place. In the name of Jesus, God, I pray for every soul in this building today. I pray for every life today, God. I pray, God, that those, God, that are feeling hopeless, God, God, that they can endure, God, the nighttime, God, and they can endure, God, the match, God, and the opportunity, God, that you're wrestling with them, Lord, and they're wrestling with you, God. You've come, God, to this place, God, and you brought them, God, to this environment, God, so they can leave, God, transformed in your presence. In the name of Jesus. feel this in my spirit today, God. I feel, God, that the battle lines, God, and what we're facing is not about the here and now. God, Jacob was fighting for his family. Jacob was fighting for his future. Jacob was fighting for his descendants. And Jacob was fighting for the promise, God. God, I feel in the spirit right now someone's engaging, God, in warfare, God. And it's not about them, God, but it's about their family, God. And it's about their tomorrow, God. And it's about their descendants and their children, God, and their grandchildren, God. What they're doing right now, God, is not about the moment, God, in the present, but it's about tomorrow, God. I feel this in the spirit today, God. Let someone get a hold of you today. In the name of Jesus. 
feel like ending it this way. We talked about Jacob having a private time in a private place. And it would be wrong of us to leave here without giving us everyone an opportunity. Wherever you're at, there's a few spots here in the front. If you would like to have a private time with God, a private moment where you can just let God speak to you and you can speak to God. And you could just tell God, God, I, I got to get a hold of you. I got to get a hold of something, God. I got to get a hold of something, God, because of what I'm dealing with. I'm asking you find a place to pray. If you have to leave, we understand. But if you can at all, spend a few moments with God. A few moments alone. Come on, with every distraction set aside. Right where your pew is. You might want to kneel down. You might want to come to the front here. There's a few spots open, but wherever you're at, take advantage of this opportunity. While all the distractions are gone, and while you can get alone with God, and you can find a place where God can intervene in your life, and God can take you from the Jacob that you are and bring you to a place of Israel to give you power with God and give you power.